Hey everyone, I'm Josh Loftus, and this is the Everyday a Monday podcast, the podcast where we talk about everyday people doing everyday things in everyday churches. Whether you're a pastor, a plumber, or the first person to try an artichoke, hats off to that brave soul, this podcast is for you. This is where we find value in the trenches of Christian life. Welcome to Every Day a Monday. And with me in the trenches today, I have a really cool guest. He's a friend of mine. He's a uh, he's the chief operations officer for a company called Beautiful Autism. He's a sci-fi nerd and from what I hear, makes some killer barbecue pulled pork, which I have not yet gotten to try. And I'm still- no, we'll, have to, we'll have to remedy that. We're gonna have to remedy that. Yep, yeah. we have got Mr. Patrick Edwards in the house with us today. Patrick, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. The sun is shining, and uh, I got a great view of uh, of the blue sky. So, well, you can't ask for more than that, right? Yeah. Yep. So, hey, Patrick, before we get going here, man, um, give us just kind of a short bio of who you are: uh, married, kids, what you do for a living. Uh, tell us about you. Yeah. So. Um... I am married. I've been married. Uh, this May will be 16 years uh, to my wonderful bride, Jen. Uh, we have a uh, cool son. His name is Nathan. Um, he is uh, hes just a really rad kid. Uh, we have a lot of fun with him. Um, he's really kind of what takes up most of our life <laughs> as a married couple. And uh, yeah, so we just, uh, you know, the three of us kind of rock it, and we, we have a lot of fun. A um, little bit about me. Uh, so just recently, uh, last year, I left my uh, corporate career um, of uh, being a Coke dealer uh, to come on board my wife's business. Coke um, dealer, meaning, meaning Coca-Cola. Yes, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, you're, yeah. you're a Coke dealer. <laughs> yeah. So my wife, uh, a little bit more about my wife. She, uh, she says I need to stop telling that joke. Uh, I told her I'll stop telling it once it stops being funny. So yeah, that's uh, fair. Yeah. It's fair. So yeah, you, no, I was, uh, you've got at least for, one more. <laughs> right. So I was working for Coca-Cola, um, as a, uh, area sales manager, uh, had a team of salespeople. Um, this last year, my wife's business has grown. Uh, so she's the owner of Beautiful Autism, along with a partner that's in Colorado. And uh, the business grew 800% over the last year. And so that really put a lot of demand uh, for her on the administrative business side, uh, when her passion is the clinical side, and that's where uh, her focus needs to be. So she asked me to come on board uh, last September. And so last September, I came on board and uh, helped transition our office to a new location, more space. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm running the business side of, of Beautiful Autism. And uh, what that is, is counseling uh, for all needs. Uh, so not just those with autism or uh, special needs, but just general counseling needs. Uh, but we specialize in autism. Uh, we provide counseling uh, behavior therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy all under one roof, uh, which really helps uh, some of these uh, kiddos and, and young adults who um, they don't have to go to multiple locations for these different services. They can all get it in one one location. So that really helps out. What's one part of that job, I guess, cause just kind of on both ends of the spectrum, you know, your your favorite part of the job, but then also the part of the job where it's just, it's it, it's the hardest for you to get through. So the best part of my job is people. Um, you know, I get to I get to really help people. I get to really kind of move. You know, when you're when you're selling Coca Cola, you know, you're you're working for a for profit company, and the goal is to, you know, grow that company and for that company's goals and and means. For me, the ability to have joy in helping people. Um, that are going through a lot of what me and my wife went through. So our son is autistic and, um, you know, we, we've gone through a lot of that journey that a lot of these parents are going through. Um, and so just being able to, uh, help other people walk through that path of having a kid on the spectrum or having a special needs kid and what that looks like, um, allows us to, you know, just gives me a lot of joy. And, and when you start doing what you love for a living, it's no longer work. Um, right. So then the hardest part of my job is people. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, with that, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of need and the hardest part of my job really is 
telling somebody that I can't help them right now, uh, whether that's because I don't have the staff that I need to be able to help everybody that comes to our door um, or insurance issues or, or anything like that. You know, there, there's things that prevent us from being able to help everybody. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of, well, you need to open a clinic here. You need to open a clinic in, you know, Mount Vernon or, you know, whatever. Uh, and I could do that uh, if, you know, I, I brought on a lot of loans and, and, and things like that. We mm -hmm. could grow rapidly, but then if we fail, we can't help anybody. And so it's just trying to manage people's expectations and letting them know there's hope, uh, but it, they might just have to wait a little bit. So that's the hardest part is, is not being able to help people right away. Sure, sure. Now, now, what is your specific role there at Beautiful Autism? What are you, what are you finding yourself doing throughout the day? Uh, everything. Um, <laughs> sure, so, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we're we're a, we're a small clinic. Uh, you know, we we've we've grown as the need has grown. Um, you know, and so when I came on board, uh, one of the main things was getting. You know, we went from a nineteen hundred square foot office space to a fifty five hundred square foot office space. And so it was getting that bigger space so that we can actually grow a little bit more, uh, have more breathing room as, as a clinic. Um, and so that was my main task uh, at that time. But I mean, right now, what I do on a day to day basis is I man, I basically am a receptionist. So I man the front, I answer phone calls, and then I'm also doing, you know, administrative um, projects like we're, we're working on certifications for a few different things. So mm -hmm. I'm doing all the background paperwork for that. Um, I work on, um, all the, you know, hiring, recruiting. Uh, so I'm doing all of that while, uh, you know, checking in people, making sure, you know, everything's good on that end. And then I'm also doing projects like, uh, after I get off with you, I'm going to go, uh, build a balance beam for our uh, occupational therapists so that they can start working on some of the modalities with balance and stuff uh, with their clients. So um, yeah. kind of jack of all trades, master and none type of thing. Sounds like you guys are packed. Yes. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, hey, just kind of uh, the story of you, Patrick, tell us a little bit of how Christ found you, how, how, how you came to, how you came to faith in Christ, whether it was a gradual thing or whether it was kind of an instant, you know, an instantaneous thing for, you know, that, that, that some people have, how did, uh, how did Christ find you, man? Growing up, I didn't, I wouldn't say I grew up in a Christian home. Um, you know, we grew up knowing of God. Um, when I was a baby, my mom and dad went to an assemblies of God church. Um, I don't really remember that except for the nursery. Uh, so, you know, there wasn't a lot of impact there. And then when my parents got divorced, um, there, there was really no going to church. Um, and growing up, you know, there was a couple of times where, you know, the local Baptist church would send the, the Sunday school bus uh, around the neighborhood, and I'd hop on that every once in a while. But nothing really impactful until uh, I got into high school. And what really started that process was a couple of kids in my high school that were um, going to a church, uh, and they invited me to youth group. So they were just being disciples who make disciples. Um, and so they invited me to youth group. I started going. Um, and the funny thing was, is I, as I was starting to go to this youth group, I found that, uh, people cared about me and were, were wanting to, uh, pour into me without any agenda. Like it was just that first time, um, that I really felt, loved without strings, um, mm -hmm. attached. And so, uh, it was something that really drew me in and, uh, I was really starting to struggle with like the weight of my sin and, and my true position before God, which was, I wasn't a part of his family. Mm. Uh, I, I was rebelling against him. Um, and my sin was rebelling against him. And I remember, uh, my grandma, um, I was up late. My grandma came out. She was, uh, she wasn't very healthy at the time. She was in and out of hospital, and and she asked me why I was upset. And I'm like, well, I'm worried. I'm going to get a phone call, and and it's going to tell me that you're gone, and I'm not going to be able to say goodbye. And without really much prompting, and just kind of naturally, she just said, well, you don't have to worry about that because we'll see each other in heaven. And it really hit me at that point in time that. Um, on the path that I was on rebelling against God that I wasn't. Um, and that there was, you know, there was very much a tangible, um, need for me to repent. Um, 
and it was very interesting. So, you know, having that, the going to a Baptist church, it was very much a, um, I choose God, like I commit my life to Christ. Um, and so at that mm -hmm. time and, and being fed what I was being fed, you know, my understanding was that I needed to repent and say the sinner's prayer and, um, right, you know, right. Uh, and that and magically, it. and magically, not a boom, bada bang, right? bada bing, I'm <laughs> saved. Uh, yeah. But what, you know, growing up in, you know, from that, moving on from that, uh, mm -hmm. getting, I mean, I remember the first time someone told me about predestination, I thought they were crazy. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until, you know, I started really reading my Bible and getting into the whole of God's story, um, you know, from creation all the way to redemption. Um, that God was preparing me and pulling me to him through the different circumstances of my life. It's always interesting to me to hear, you know, the different breadcrumbs that God leaves with certain people, right. you know, and, and the, and how you can, when you're on this side of salvation and you have an understanding, you know, even, even just a small understanding of God's sovereignty, you can look at the different events and people that God placed in your life and see where they connect. And it's just, it's, it's mind blowing every time. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it really is. It's just, it's just incredible. Um, <clears throat> so give us a, a look into where you're going to church. Uh, and then what is one aspect of your church that you really, really appreciate that you really value? Um, yeah. So I go to Damascus road church, um, in Marysville, Washington. Uh, it is, we've been going there since we came back from Colorado uh, so almost four years now. Um, the thing I appreciate about my church is really the drummer. I mean, he's just a rock star. Um, you know, he's up there just, just banging away, syncopation. Um, and if you, for those of you who can't see, uh, Josh's face right now, he is just completely <laughs> flushed, um, red because he is our drummer at Damascus Road Church. No, the oh thing my I, goodness. Yeah. The, the thing I truly appreciate about our church uh, is it's a group of people that just want to make Jesus known to people. And um, they do that a lot through plugging in and being a part of what's going on. And so there's, um, you know, from the time you walk into our church, uh, you are welcomed. I mean, everyone wants to say they have a friendly church, but I mean, I think, I believe we have a friendly church, but it, you're going to you're going to be known by somebody. Um, and the, the goal is not to um, just kind of be, a, you know, you don't just sit in a pew. Like people are going to want to know who you are and um, they're going to want you to know who they are. And so it's just really a church about connecting on a real level um, because we're all disciples of Jesus who um, are called to share the gospel and bring people into a relationship with him. So, yeah, yeah. Now, now, what are what are some of the primary ways that you are involved in service there at uh, Damascus? So, uh, right now, I serve on the hospitality team. Uh, so, I do that twice twice a month to basically greet and make coffee. And and some people say that's the most important part. Uh, is the coffee. <laughs> you gotta have good coffee. Yeah, you <laughs> do. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Uh, so I serve in that capacity. I also lead uh, what, what's called D group. So D group is a um, gender specific Bible study. So we have men's D groups and women's D groups, uh, and we go through um, different aspects. Right now, we're going through the wisdom of God, um, kind of looking at the Old Testament and um, going through that. Uh, and then, so I lead one of those on um, Wednesday nights, and then I also help lead a. Uh, road group, which is our church's um, community groups or um, discipleship groups, uh, meet you know biweekly in the homes. You know, families of the church come together, and you know, really, it's that you know first line of being known is, is our road groups. Um, it, it allows a, a good place for fellowship and food and family to happen. You know, the family mm -hmm. of the church to happen. And right. So I I help lead one of those, and then just kind of being available to do whatever we need to do. So if we have projects that come up, just, you know, want to plug in and, and serve. So when you think about service, both in and out of, out of church, so your service there at Damascus, plus your work at beautiful autism, 
how does your faith, your Christianity, the Christian worldview that you subscribe to, how how does that filter in and through your work? No matter, there shouldn't be a distinction of the service you do in the church and the service you do at your job, um, because we are to serve wholeheartedly in every capacity of our lives. And if the gospel mm. is truly penetrating us fully, then the way that I serve at my church and the way that I serve my job, there should be no distinction. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think a lot of times people serve at the church to be seen. Uh, people serve to um, kind of make themselves feel good about themselves. And people do that in their normal jobs as well. I mean, they, they do mm -hmm. extra projects or they, or they do something to, you know, make sure the boss sees them and says, Oh, good job. And so, you know, people, you know, people worship that idol of, of affirmation uh, in many different ways. And so, you know, I think a lot of it we have to ask ourselves and I myself have just really looked at my job and my service in the church are just part of my discipleship and, and me being a disciple. And, you know, the way that I love people when I go to church and I'm serving them coffee in the morning is mm -hmm. the same way that I love um the people that come into my clinic and my staff, you know, I look at them and I love and serve them, not because I get something out of them, but because they are created in the image of God and they're worthy and they are, um, they're image bearers. And, you know, that's important. And I think when we look at service, it needs to be um, one of humility um, mm -hmm. and one of repentance because we, uh, we need to repent of that pride that is in all of us to say, I want to do this because, you know, I'm going to be recognized or I'm going to get something in return, but really I want to sure. do this because it glorifies, it's an act of worship to, to God who has given us more than we can ever deserve. So. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 No, exactly. And I think that that's a very helpful distinction to label it an act of worship. Mm-hmm. You know, because so often you can just see like, like service in church, like serving on the hospitality, making coffee. It's like, oh, I'm just making the coffee. Like, that's it. It's like, no, in your, in you making that coffee, you serving church, you, you, you serving in church, serving the, your brothers and sisters in Christ, that is an act of worship. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we need to get into this, at least I think this mentality that everything we do as Christians, ultimately, as we know from scripture is to be done for the glory of God, whether you eat, whether you drink, everything's done for that. And that's done in worship, right? It's done in thankfulness. It's done in, in, in gratitude for even just the ability to be able to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so when you think of, uh, I guess kind of a two part question, when you think of perhaps the modern day church's attitude toward worship versus what you believe the attitude should be of a person that makes a good servant. What are, what are those two ends of the spectrum? Do you think in our, in our, in our culture today? Uh, I think, I think it just is easily summed up in uh, selfishness, selfishness and selflessness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you know, the modern church, uh, one of the things we struggle with um, and, and you've talked about it with some of your previous guests, uh, consumerism. I mean, it's, it's a huge mm -hmm. issue in the church. Yeah. Um, I mean, just, I can't tell you the, the thing that drives me the most nuts about that is the idea of church shopping. Like I'm going to shop for a church. <laughs> sure. It's like, no, sure. You, you shop for a car, <laughs> you shop for a house, you don't shop for a church. Um, you know, you go to a church, you serve in a church, and, you know, the question of that, of service isn't, what am I going to get from this church, or what am I going to get from this job, even? Um, mm. you, you know, in it's even what, working... What can I give? What can I add? Right? What can I add to this? Yeah. What right. can I bring to this church that can help the gospel grow? And so mm -hmm. when I go to Damascus, I'm not going to Damascus to say, okay, what can I get out of it? How can I get fed? Which is a just a frustrating term that we use a lot in Christian, you know, oh, I just don't feel fed. Well, you need to read your Bible. Um, you know, it's <laughs> like, well, sure. <laughs> you know, the pastor's there to, to, to lead you, not spoon feed you. And, um, you know, the... The truth is, is, is the majority of people have gifts and talents that they can be leveraging for the gospel in their local churches, and mm -hmm. they don't. 
uh, because there's apathy and there's this idea of I need to be fed, I need to be served, I need to be coddled, loved, um, and, and all those things. Uh, but really, you, you need to serve. And for some people, their level of service is showing up. Um, you know, and as they grow and, and are discipled, then that level of service grows uh, yeah, because they right. get convicted by the word of God and they, they become aware of needs and God, you know, ex- opens their heart uh, to, to more and more needs. Um, you know, a perfect example of this is I've seen guys that have gone from just coming to church to, you know, taking charge of an event um, and, and, Next thing you know, they're serving in multiple different capacities because as they grow in, in, in their discipleship, God opens their hearts and their eyes to the service that's needed. So, right, yeah, yeah. And and how should how should we as Christians be encouraging our brothers and sisters in serving in church? I think a lot of it has to do with um, asking them what's preventing them from serving. Like, mm-hmm. if, you know, what what's what's really going on? Why why aren't you willing to serve or why aren't you, um, plugging in? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and in, in my experience, sometimes it's, uh, they just don't know what, where they fit in. Mm-hmm. And so it's just a matter of, of working with them and, and finding, you know, what their talents are and finding appropriate ways to get them connected. Sometimes they, you know, their struggle to serve is because they have a sin that is, in their life that is unrepentant of and that they feel hypocritical. And so, you know, they can't serve because I have the sin, but I don't want to confess this sin because then I'm going to look bad in front of everybody or so there, so there's a level of that, that, that I think happens. So, but ultimately, especially for, for guys that are married, um, you know, my wife is one of the greatest servants I know. And if she, you know, were to stop doing, half of the stuff that she does. I mean, I'm a mess on my own. When she's out of town, I'm just a complete mess. And so I, I try and use that analogy like, hey, if people stop serving, like we're we're going to be a mess as a church yeah. and we're not going to be able to do the things that we need to do because if we just put it on one person, if we just put it on the pastor uh, or we just put it on um, you know, the elders, th- they're only going to be able to do so much. And the mm-hmm. church has always been communal. The church has always been about a group of people serving one another and the community in which they live. And so just kind of walking them and encouraging them that, you know, they are an important member of the body. They are a brick that, that is being, um, attached to the cornerstone, which is Christ, and we are building mm-hmm. something. That's a that's a very good mindset that we should be working to get ourselves into, is viewing the church not so much as a building because it's not, as a community, brothers and sisters, and and realize that you are here to serve them. You're here to serve them and bring glory to God. Right? It's just kind of a, a a side note. I've never found a better remedy for pride or selfishness than service. Yeah, absolutely. Ever. I've I've never found anything that will cure somebody. Well, you know, air quotes, cure somebody of selfishness than, than serving. Right. You know, and that, and that's going to cost you something. Um, you know, you know, Tim, I think it was Tim Keller. He said that you can't bear another's burden without taking on some of that burden. Like mm-hmm. when we truly serve other people, like it's going to be, it's going to take something out of us. It's going to cost yeah. us something, whether it's time, whether it's money, whether it's emotional energy, you know, whatever it is, it's, we have to sacrifice a little bit of ourselves when we serve other people. And I think that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks is we don't want to sacrifice any of ourselves for other people. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. So yet at the same time, we all have, we all have those people that we can look at in our life that did that for us, mm-hmm. you know, and that when we were, when we were, you know, down, down in the trenches <laughs> and not doing well, we have those people that came and pulled us up and, 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 and not just pulled us up, got in the trenches with us. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. That actually got into our pain and our frustration with us and brought the gospel. 
right? Yeah. And and and, and uh, you know, for lack of a better term, kicked us in the teeth with the gospel because that's that's what we need, right? Is yeah. is to, is to show Christ and His humility and seeing that in other people, which leads right into the next the next question here is Patrick when you when you think about Christians either that you know personally or that you've read or listened to whatever when you think about the Christians that inspire you that cause you to want to pursue Christ more than you do now one who are those Christians and two what are the traits that they possess that really do that for you um for me the Christians that that inspire me would be the ones that show up. The, the reason I say that is because there's a million reasons not to show up to stuff. Mm. There's a million reasons not to be there for people. I'm too tired. I'm too, you know, I got work or I have, you know, I have all these different things that are going on in my life. Uh, the sun, you know, it's cloudy outside, you know, uh, or, you know, oh, it's too hot or, you know, there's a million excuses. I mean, we live, I mean, in the pack Northwest where, you know, we're no more than an hour and a half, two hours from a mountain or a beach. I mean, there's a lot of recreation we can do. You know, there's a lot of reasons not to serve. Um, and so what, what really encourages me and inspires me is, is when people show up. So Patrick, I know you've, you, uh, we've, we've talked off the air before. I know you have a, a history in church ministry yeah. and, as anybody knows who's been serving in church for any amount of time, you get those funny stories. You get those unforgettable moments that just stick with you and uh, and 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 never quite go away, despite how much you might want them to. So yeah. for you, Patrick, give us one of the most funniest or most unforgettable moments, church experiences that you have had. All right. Yeah. So, oh, gosh, there's just so many. Sure. Um, shoot. <laughs> what's the one thing I would say? Uh, one of the funniest things, uh, w was when I was a youth pastor, um, we went on a trip out to Seabrook, Washington, um, in February for a winter retreat. Um, and we rented this big house, uh, out there and, uh, you know, we, we arrive, you know, late in the evening, uh, on the Friday and all the kids pile out of the church van, um, and that in itself is, is funny stories, church fan stories. There should be a whole like Instagram thing oh, about just, oh, church, just church, church fan, fan stories. Yeah. Oh, that'd and, be awesome. uh, yeah. So, Best. but anyway, so all the kids pile out and I'm unloading everything and you know, the kids go find their rooms. Well, this house kind of had, so it had a basement, but then it had like an unfinished part of the basement where there was like utility room. And then there was just like this, this room that, you know, just was brick and it, there was nothing in there. Well, some of the boys um, decided that it would be entertaining for them. Uh, all of a sudden, I, I come downstairs and one of the kids is being dragged um, out of the, the finished area where all the, you know, uh, rumpus room type places down this little hall around this corner. And I'm like, what's going on? So I run around the corner to find that they are um, basically making a mock terrorist video, like in this unfinished basement. They're wearing scarves around their heads. I mean, it's completely inappropriate. But it's just one of those things where it's just like, you, is this really, actually happening? Right? Really? Is this actually <laughs> happening? Like, I'm going to have to have this conversation. Like, here I come upon, you know, a group of boys who, who are, are pretending to make a, you know, a, a ransom video, uh, a terrorist ransom video. And... I'm not gonna lie. There was there was part of me that was just like, okay, that's funny, but right? And then you're like, wait, wait no, 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 that that shouldn't be funny. Um, and so so yeah, I had to be like, hey guys, that's really not appropriate. And if anybody has recorded anything, you should probably just delete it. Um, yeah, delete it. Right yeah. Now. So you know you you and that's that's the life of the youth pastor. Really, is you come upon stuff and you try and do damage control right away. Um, uh, but well, yeah, and it's always the boys too. It, it like, I'm sorry. Like, like I, I mean, I, I was a youth pastor also. Yeah. It was always the boy. I never yeah. had trouble like, like that yeah. with the girls. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, and that's, that's what it is, is, is the boys get in trouble and the girls eat all the food. Like girls can yeah. pack it away. 
<laughs> oh man. Well, <laughs> Patrick, we have uh, come to the end of our time, um, you know, with terrorist videos and church service. Uh, <laughs> um, it is now time for the Monday hot takes, which Sweet. is the point where I ask you a bunch of random questions and you give me the first thing that pops into your head. You ready for these? Oh man, this is what I've been waiting for. All right. Yeah. 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 This is the best part of the podcast. It should just be a podcast of this podcast honestly. of hot takes. That's right. Hot, hot takes podcast. Yeah. All right. Favorite movie. Uh, Princess Bride. Oh, yes. Love Without it. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. It's the most quotable movie of all time. Well, it, it's the greatest movie of all time. And you know, at, I, we're both kind of movie aficionados. Um, and, and I will put that movie up against anything any day. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, favorite band or slash artist? Queen. Queen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The greatest rock go. band of all time. All right. Hey, you know, I, it's hard to argue. Yep. Uh, what is something about current Christian culture that's annoying to you? The inability to make a good movie. Oh. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for like, saying that. Like, don't. I, it's, I appreciate that. There. Oh, we don't need goodness. another God's Not Dead movie. We don't. Um, <laughs> he's not dead. He's still alive. He's a, God's Not Dead again? <laughs> again and again. And like we've been saying this for 2,000 years. We didn't need a movie about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, well, yeah. No, I mean, that's honestly, it's the Newsboys' attempt to be relevant again. And it's just it's just falling flat on their face. It's not working. Right? Well, the, the problem is it's it, they're going to, you know, we're going to, they're going to be 90 and they're going to make a God's not dead movie. And it's going to be yep. it's just bad. The music video is going to be horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It will be. But I can almost guarantee you, Michael Tate will still be in the same jeans. Uh, moving on, moving on from that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Favorite food. Oh, biscuits and gravy. Oh, all right. There you go. Least favorite food. You know what? I, I, Carrots. Let's just put carrots. Uh, carrots are probably my least favorite food. Have you ever walked out of the theater? Almost. Okay. Uh, Which movie? Why? Uh, it was Dungeons and Dragons. So they That's actually, a movie? Yes. So they, they actually made a movie. I was working at a movie theater at the time. Okay. And we uh, it was back before everything was digital. So we had to put the movies together on a reel. And, oh, know, yeah. A bunch of reels, yep. put them all together. Yep. And then we had to watch the movies to make sure we put them together right. And okay. I drew the, I drew the short straw and I had to watch that movie and I almost, I had, I not have to be paid to actually see it and sit there. I would have right. walked out of it. Um, it was, yeah. it was so bad. It was yeah. so yeah. bad. What's your go-to karaoke song? Don't stop believing. <laughs> By journey. <laughs> yes. Second greatest band of all time. You better hit those high notes, man. Otherwise Steve Perry will be mad at you. Yeah. Um, let's see. Star Wars or Star Trek. Both. You can't. That's yes, that's can. not. Yes. Well, okay. You can't. That's okay. most people will say you can't. Yes. For see, the problem was is growing up, my mom would stay up late and watch movies, and I'd get out, I'd sneak out of bed, and she would either be watching Star Wars, she would either be watching Star Trek, or she'd be watching mm -hmm. Indiana Jones. So. Wow. So okay. Yeah. So that's that was like my my baptism of movies was those movies, and so um, well, if if I had movie. to, yeah, there are. Um, yeah, yeah. if I, if I had to, I would say Star Trek because the newer movies don't just completely destroy the old ones. Oh, okay. Harsh. Yeah. No, I hear you. That's a, that's a popular opinion. Um, or an unpopular, depending on which circles you run in. Uh, the Clone let's Wars see. is almost unwatchable. You, you can't watch it now. <laughs> like, I, I, oh, that's I, right. You're a prequel hater. I no, forgot no, that. no. It, I'm not a prequel hater. The Clone Wars is literally unwatchable. The the dialogue is horrible. The graphics are just horrid, <laughs> horrid, horrid. It's completely unwatchable. <laughs> you are literally taking my childhood and stabbing a meat cleaver into its chest over I'm sorry. and over and over. It's just it's, it's unwatchable. That yeah, I hear you. What's the best advice you've ever been given? Stop it. <laughs> just stop it. Yeah. And uh, last question: When you get into heaven. Other than Christ, of course, who is the first person that you are looking forward to meeting? I mean, I'd love to say something theologically profound and and you know talk about some great scholar, but you know, to be totally honest with you, I, I'd probably just want to go see my grandparents. Um, yeah, you know, uh, there. It's been a long time since I, I saw my grandma Mary, and she would probably be the first one I'd want to go see. 
Very cool. Because the scholars, yeah. they're going to be too busy. They're, they're going to have lines. Um, yeah, that's right. It's going to be like know. Disneyland. You leave yeah. the fast path to get yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. And, and to be totally honest with you, you know, they're all going to be in line for Jesus anyway. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll go with Grandma Mary. All right. There you go. No, that's great, man. Well, Patrick, we have come to the end of our time, my friend. Um, it has been a blast as I knew it would be. Um, thanks for being on the podcast with me, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, not a problem, man. Thanks for talking. So everybody, you can head on over to iTunes and leave a uh, raving review and a five-star rating, if you don't mind. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Music, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, we are there. You can head over to facebook.com slash Monday. And thank you all for joining us in the trenches today. And we will catch you on the next step of Every Day a Monday.